Well, good morning, Series 7 test takers. This is Dean Tenney. I'm coming to you from my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas. Uh, I've been asked, uh, can you provide more suitability content? And uh, the answer is always on view requests. Uh, yeah, we can certainly do that. Uh, I may put this in the, the playlist for 65 as well as SIE might be a little overkill. Uh, but what we're going to do is a little intellectual inventory through the various investment vehicles and what are they suitable for. This isn't going to take the place of narrative lectures. We have entire lectures on equity securities. We're just going to, you know, it's a summary, if you will. We have entire 18 hours on options. So this is not a uh, delayed knowledge base. This is just to kind of give you an overview of suitability. I'm going to set my timer. This is going to be a longer lecture because we're basically going to take a low budget bus hound, uh, Greyhound bus tour through all of the various investment vehicles and their suitability. I don't know how long that will take, but uh, we'll set the timer for 30 minutes. So if you want to take a break, you can can do so. Or if I want to take a break, I can do so. And who knows, I may break this into two parts. So if you see part one, part two, it means I made that decision. If you don't see a part one, part two, it means this is it. There's only uh, one lecture. All right, well, let's get started. So uh, I think where a lot of people struggle with suitability is suitability can be judgment questions. You know, the three styles of questions you get on your exam are recognition, practical application, and judgment. And suitability questions are judgment questions. You know, there are 91 questions on your Series 7 on investment vehicles. And so I think that people think there's 91 suitability questions. There's really not. To uh, determine suitability on the investment vehicle for the right driver, in that analogy of the wrong driver, you need to know the product. And so I think when people struggle on suitability, it's a lot of times because they don't actually know the product well enough to know when it is or is not suitable. Now, if I do break this into two parts, the second part will be most likely suitable, least likely suitable given somebody's investment objectives. All right, so let's get started. So equity securities, as you can see here, when we are recommending our terms of suitability, what are uh, who are equity securities good, good for? They're good for somebody who's interested in growth or capital appreciation and very testable on all the exams to know that common stocks or equity securities are the best hedge for inflation. Hedge means offset risk. And so the risk of inflation or purchasing power risk is that, you know, you're getting your time machine 15, 20 years from now and things cost more and you have the same amount of money as you started with. So um, be careful about questions they're asking about a hedge or outperforming inflation versus just uh, you know stick uh, doing the same. So what I'm saying is be careful with an answer set where you have tips versus stocks. If I say keep pace, that's going to be a tip, and we'll talk about that later. If I say you know outpa uh, outpace, keep pace, outpace, beat inflation, then it would be uh, stocks. Uh, purchase for income, we have preferred stock, and so preferred stock or uh, stocks of utility companies because both preferred stocks and common stocks particularly pay dividends. So you'd be interested in income if you're uh, purchasing stocks with dividends. You know, in poker, the blue chip is the most expensive chip in the play. You know, so when you're playing poker, that's the blue chip. And a blue chip company is a common stock of a corporation that has a proven track record in good times and bad. And that proven track record in their resources through the economic cycle means they might be a good recommendation for somebody who's interested in price appreciation as well as some income as well. So that would be good for both of those. A combination of common and preferred stocks, we can mix it up that way as well to get that income. Uh, ADRs, they have currency risk. That's certainly testable that they have currency risk. But in terms of suitability, when you buy an American depository receipt, when you're exposing yourself to a foreign security that is traded in our domestic market, what you're looking for is additional diversification. You know, the fancy word for additional diversification under modern portfolio theory is you're looking for negative uh, correlation. You're hoping that your foreign securities holdings will be moving differently than your domestic uh, securities. Uh, REITs typically trade, most of them, and for test purposes, all of them, trade uh, supply and demand of the secondary market like Boston Properties, BXP, trades on the New York Stock Exchange. And so it's a way to own real estate and still be able to cash out in T plus two. In other forms of real estate own ownership, you can't cash out and get your check on T plus two. T plus two is settlement, right? So whenever you sell a stock or 
turn stock back into money, it typically takes T plus two to do so. So anyways, that's just certainly more liquid than calling a real estate agent and say, sell my apartment building and send me a check of T plus two or uh, investing in the context of a partnership. Of course, somebody who wants real estate exposure in the portfolio, this is a liquid way to do so. And so that's the suitability issue there. So uh, we said you could be an owner or you could be a lender. So let's talk about some of our debt securities. In debt securities, you're interested in income. You're hoping that the person who has borrowed the money, in this case, an unnatural person, the issuer, the corporation, will pay you semi-annual interest, a return on your capital, and at the end, a return of your capital. That income that the issuer will be paid will pay to you be paid to you semi-annually. And you should definitely know that the you know, bonds pay semi-annually. Now, in terms of suitability, that might be inconvenient to get a bond that pays you January and July. So maybe as your investment professional, I buy you some J&Js, some F&As, some M&Ss, A&Os, M&Ns. That all means April, October, May and November, June and December. And then maybe that way we have uh, money coming in from our various bonds every month instead of every six months, but it is testable. Now, if the corporation is the one paying you this interest, you as an investor are going to be taxed at all levels. Now, what all level means, what all levels means, I'm using my blue annotation tool. I sometimes it doesn't look like it's holding here. But anyways, uh, there are three levels you may be taxed on. You know, some cities, very few, but Philadelphia, for example, New York, have a city income tax. And uh, most states have a state income tax. And then the US government, right? you have a federal income tax. And that's what we mean by saying the interest will be taxed at all levels. So assuming you live in New York City, the city, uh, New York City wants you know, its taxes, New York State wants its taxes, and the US government wants its taxes. Now I'm coming to you from Nevada. And I'm coming to you from uh, Las Vegas, Clark County, Nevada. We don't have a city income tax or we don't have a state income tax. So for me, interest tax at all levels would just mean uh, the, the federal level. Uh, we have convertible bonds. Now, convertible bonds allow you to switch your status from becoming a from being a creditor to becoming an owner. And that means you're going to get a lower in, uh, coupon on that. So we're not recommending a, a convertible bond in terms of suitability for somebody who's looking to maximize their income. We're looking for somebody who might want to lend their money and get something more than they're going to get on the common stock, for example. You know, in my parody lecture on convertibles, I use Starbucks. The Starbucks had issued a 6% convertible bond early in its life stage. That is certainly more than the common stock pays the dividends because it pays no dividend whatsoever. So there you're going to get an income stream less than straight debt. At the time, straight debt was more like nine or 10. So you're going to get less. But then you have this opportunity to switch your status from saying, hey, I no longer want to be a lender. I want to be an owner. And then you know, you're responsible to know uh, how to calculate parity, do that kind of stuff. Uh, call risk, let me get on my annotation tool here. Uh, call risk is associated with a declining interest rate environment. And so, you know, interest rates go down and the issuer calls the bonds away from you. And you say, well, Dean, just give me another one that pays that same rate. And I said, well, you're missing the point. I mean, the whole point is the issuer has refinanced this high cost debt because they can reissue lower cost debt. And you now are going to have to reinvest at today's lower rate. Now, a couple of things, call, uh, uh, call risk. We are held accountable to know there are certain things that have no call risk. So if that's an issue for my customer, zero coupon bonds have no call risk and T notes and T bonds have no call risk because they're not called. And I'll leave it to you to go learn about call protection and do all that kind of stuff. That's not the point of today's uh, you know, suitability lecture. High yield bonds, so you should definitely know that high yield bonds, less than investment grade, have a higher default risk. And so here somebody's willing to accept a higher level of risk to get that higher uh, interest rate, that higher coupon. Now, we would certainly, if we're gonna be considering buying high yield bonds to diversify your portfolio, maybe I say, okay, well, yeah, well, they do have more risk, but let's make sure we are properly diversified and so maybe we want to have a diversified portfolio of high yield bonds that, that lowers the risk, a selection risk of a particular bond defaulting. And maybe we want to consider a high yield bond fund, for example, a mutual fund. So speculative, I uh, hear we say speculative, but it's not 
uh, you know, spe as speculative as other things, but in terms of the bond category of high credit quality, medium credit quality, and high credit quality, it's certainly more speculative than those. Uh, zero coupon bonds are very testable. Let me clear this here. Let me clear this. Uh, I would expect two, three, four questions on zero coupon bonds. Zero coupon, no coupon. So no interest paid until maturity. And then suitability, these are great for somebody who needs a set sum of money at some future date. That's very much a suitability question on the exam. A target investment. For example, we have a kid that's starting college in X number of years. We can buy a zero coupon bond that matures uh, for X number of dollars, you know, however many years from today. You know, I joke about a zero coupon bond I bought for my friend's baby and the baby's got 18 years to college and I bought an 18 year zero. Income or adjustment bonds only pay interest when and if earned. These are used in bankruptcies and restructurings. And so this is kind of counterintuitive, but this is not a retail investment. It's not suitable for investors seeking the income, even though it's called an income or adjustment bond. And if you're invested in distressed securities, securities where the issuer is in bankruptcy or we try and restructure their debts, uh, again, that's a, that's a speculative proposition. It's not like lending you know, Microsoft or Johnson & Johnson money. You know, Microsoft and Johnson & Johnson are AAA credit quality. So that's not speculative to lend them money. To lend an issuer money through the context of an adjustment, uh, income or adjustment bond is uh, speculative. Uh, collateralized mortgage obligations. Again, not suitable for small or unsophisticated investors. You know, what we're doing is carving up a mortgage pool into various cascading cash flows. You know, I would also know that uh, the whole point of carving this up is now some people have more risk and some people have less risk. And you should be able to determine the uh, less risk being the plan amortization classes, PACs, versus tax targeted amortization classes. You know, the test question there is that PACs have more predictability and therefore lower risk in terms of what's going to happen with the cash flows. And, uh, you know, tax targeted amortization classes have, you know, higher risk and higher uh, or less predictability. Uh, I'd also know that the uh, investor has to sign a suitability statement saying that they understand they're buying a speculative security or more importantly, a derivative security, like an option that derives its performance that they understand they're not buying proportion ownership in a mortgage pool, but rather a cash flow from a mortgage pool. Money market securities are in every exam. You definitely need to know that money market securities is high quality debt during less than a year. You would definitely need to know they're typically put found in a money market fund and they're interested for somebody who wants to purchase stuff for safety of principle and liquidity. And liquidity. These are very easy, the security itself, or in the context of a money market fund, very easy. These markets are very liquid. So uh, very easy to get in and out of these uh, these money market securities. Again, this isn't a lecture on money market securities, but you know, bankers' acceptances, test question are used to facilitate foreign trade. I would definitely know that. I would know that uh, bankers' acceptances and commercial paper are issued at a discount and have a 270-day max maturity. Uh, United States government debt, treasury securities. Uh, there's no better credit quality than that of the United States government. You know, so if I tell you I'm already rich, just don't make me poor, Dean, I don't need to take any credit risk. I said, well, if you don't need to take credit risk, the risk that an issuer will default than what we would consider as treasury securities. As you see here, it's the safest debt when it comes to default or credit risk. Now, the interest you receive on treasury debt is exempt from state and local tax. So if you buy a treasury security, in my example, the city of Philadelphia, the city of New York cannot tax you on that. And the state of Pennsylvania or the state of New York can't tax you on that. And people who are buying debt securities, all debt securities, including US government debt, are purchasing it, now this one, for income and key point. All debt securities are purchased for income, but here's safety, right? And since it has that additional safety, you're not gonna get uh, paid as much in terms of interest. Uh, bills, notes, and bonds. I know bills are issued a discount, and that is the safest money market security. Treasury bills, and we said like commercial paper, like uh, bankers' acceptances, they're issued a discount. Notes and bonds pay semi-annual interest. Tips, definitely gonna be on the test. Treasury inflation protection securities 
And the uh, suitability here is it keeps pace with inflation. So again, this is an electron tip so that they're gonna semi-annually adjust the principal that the government owes you based on the consumer price index. I'll leave it to you to you know, learn the investment. Right now, we're just talking about suitability. And tips are good because they keep pace with inflation. Now be careful about phraseology. That means, you know, inflation is 7%. The US government is gonna adjust the principal by 7% and therefore your interest payments will keep pace. Now, remember outpays means common stock. So, you know, a lot of these suitability judgment questions, you can get to a 50-50 pretty quickly and say, okay, well, I know those two are, I know it's one of these. And then you just gotta be real careful of the phraseology and uh, you, uh, you gotta pick the one. So if it says keep pace with inflation, tip, outpace inflation, common stock. Well, the government Congress has authorized various uh, agencies to issue securities. The major ones being Ginnie Mae, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. And uh, all, all of these are attacks to all levels. They're very safe. Ginnie Mae is as safe as any other uh, security that has direct obligation of the full faith and credit of the United States government, that's testable. Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae have an implied bet. We assume that if they got into trouble and they asked for assistance, uh, the answer would be, yeah, we're, you know, we'll come to their assistance. Uh, Ginnie Mae is the only investment vehicle that pays interest in principal monthly on your exam. And so, you know, if we have somebody who needs to be paid interest in principal monthly, would like to get a monthly check, this would be something we could recommend for them in terms of suitability. They're getting a return of their interest in principal each month. You know, this is the only, again, other one that pays, you know, principal monthly. Remember, the regular bonds pay principal at maturity. So that interest you're being paid monthly represents both the interest on the mortgages within the pool plus the principal. Remember, when you make your mortgage payment, which is being passed through, your mortgage payment is interest in principal. Uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac pay every six months. Uh, laddering, I haven't had anybody tell me they've seen this in the seven until I, I, a very recently conducted debrief. And uh, this test taker did get test on a laddered bond portfolio. And a laddered bond portfolio means we always have bonds coming due that we can reinvest at today's interest rates. And so the strategy here would be to increase the liquidity of portfolio. More importantly, let me make a text note here. It uh, helps us, uh, it lowers interest rate risk. Now, what I mean by that is you say, Dean, man, interest rates are going up and my bonds are going down. But I say, yeah, the good news is we have some bonds that are rolling off or maturing and we can reinvest those at today's higher rates. So that's why we would do that, a laddered bond portfolio. Municipal securities. The number one reason suitability, we buy municipal securities because the interest is tax exempt at the federal level. It uh, depends whether or not uh, this will gonna be taxable at the state and local level. That depends on where you live and what kind of bond you buy. So we're definitely gonna have to determine suitability, but no matter where you live, what state, what city, the interest you receive will be tax exempt at the federal level. Uh, anytime on the test, they say your client's an uncomfortably high tax bracket, or they give you a tax bracket, well, then you know you're talking about immunity. You know, so make sure you can do, I'm not gonna do it here. Again, we're just talking about suitability, but how do we determine whether somebody is suitable? What's more suitable, this is a little, presentation on suitability, what's more suitable, taxable yields from a corporate bond or a tax-free yield from a municipal bond? And so what you gotta be prepared to do on your exam is calculate the tax-free equivalent yield or the taxable equivalent yield. I'll leave it to you in your notes if you're taking notes on this uh, to put that in your notes and say, okay, oh, that's something I had to work on. Now it would be totally unsuitable. And I told you the second part of this lecture and who knows where I'll put it in. Uh, one lecture, I'm gonna put it in two, is it uh, not suitable, right? It's not suitable for retirement accounts because it would be foolish to be collecting tax-free income in the context of a retirement plan where taxes aren't an issue until you withdraw. So definitely not suitable for retirement accounts. As I said, it's not gonna be uh, suitable for somebody who's in a lower tax bracket based on the math. Now, I would tell you, we want to embrace math, particularly as it applies to suitability questions, because there's no you know, distinction about 
you know, what the right answer is in terms of suitability if it's just a matter of performing some math. So you want to embrace that even if you're not a math person. Uh, we have geos and revenues. We have uh, municipal notes, TANs, BANs, RANs, and TRANs. Uh, those do show up on the exam. And, you know, we have money market uh, funds, but we have taxable money market funds on the test, and we have tax-free money market funds on the test. And you say, well, Dean, what is in a money market fund? I say high quality debt maturing in less than a year. And, uh, you know, it might be a good idea to park your idle money. That's very testable. Idle money, you know, money you need in short term to buy a house in six months or whatever within the context of a money market fund. You know, they have an NAV of a buck. Again, not a lecture on money market funds, even though that's very testable. It's a lecture on suitability. And so now a couple of test questions about suitability. You know, we talked about suitability as it relates to a money market fund, but then we have tax, tax free, and we have to figure out which one is the better parking spot, so to speak. Um, please note in the tax free money market fund, we're gonna have TANs, BANs, and RANs in there. So you see here, uh, short-term debt months up to three years. If it's in the money market fund, TAM, BANs, and RANs, it's gonna be less than a year. And uh, I, and, you know, this document says up to three, but for our purposes, it's gonna be uh, less than a year. It's gonna be a money market security. When I say for our purposes, that means outside of Series 7 Fantasyland, and the world could be different, but inside Series 7 Fantasyland, that's how the world works, right? So um, good news, you pass your exam, you get to leave Series 7 Fantasyland. I'm stuck here permanently. No wonder I'm demented. Okay, so options, not an options lecture, God knows. We got an options play with, playlist with, you know, uh, 20 hours of le option lectures for you. But why do people buy options? Well, if they're buying an option, a lot of times they're doing so for leverage. You're gonna make money twice as fast, sometimes more than twice as fast as you would in buying the underlying stock position long or selling the stock position short. Now, we should know that that same supercharged speed money we're gonna make money with is the same supercharged speed we're gonna lose money for with. And so when we just have a, somebody who buys a call or sells a call or buys a put or sells a put, that is speculative. They're betting on the stock price. And our four basic positions are buying a call where you're buying upward volatilities. They, okay, I think the stock is going to go up. I think it's going to go up at least, and it's going to happen within my time frame. And when you buy an option, no big deal, right? Because you just lose your premium. Very easy to qualify suitability here. Is this money you can afford to lose? And when you sell an option, that's primarily for income. And of all the foolish things you can do, Selling naked calls, agreeing to sell stock you don't own is very, very foolish. You know, guaranteed test question that has unlimited loss potential. I can't think of a scenario in which selling short a naked call is going to be suitable. There are, if, you know, other things you could do like a covered call or credit call spread. So, you know, be careful for unsuitable, which is the reverse question about what's suitable, what's not. Buying a put. A uh, very prudent thing as a bear to do, because when you buy a put, a choice to sell, you're buying downward volatility. And if you're wrong, you just lose your premium. You know, there's a lot of more foolish things you could do, like the naked call or shorting the stock, whatever the case may be. I just posted a article today on our R Series 7 Reddit about Bill Ackman, who's a hedge fund guy, saying he's never going to sell any more stock short. <laughs> My heading to the post was, you know, yeah, it's a lot of risk, but not a lot of reward. Why would you want to do it? Uh, when you short a put, you are bullish. Now, I, this is a companion. I don't know if I call it companion. I'll link to my 50 question suitability uh, practice exam. Uh, but I have a link there. Uh, I'll put a link there. And one of the questions I ask about suitability on puts that people don't tell me they've seen is you sell a put here for income, but you also can sell a put. Let me get on my annotation tool as an alternative to a limit order. And again, I'm not lecturing here, but why not get paid, do something you're already prepared to do. So if I'm already prepared to buy the stock, you know, uh, let's say I'll just use Apple. Apple today, last time I checked, uh, was trading at uh, 157. So I'm gonna put in a limit at uh, 155, let's say. And my broker says, Dean, you're willing to buy Apple at 155. I go, yeah, 155 or less, I'm in. And they say, well, Dean, uh, what you might want to consider is selling a put and get paid in advance to buy Apple at 155. You can sell the 155 puts. If you could exercise, you'd be buying the stock at the equivalent of the strike price uh, less the premium. 
So that's another reason to sell options, to get paid to do something you're already prepared to do. Hedge means offset risk. Hedge means offset risk. So, you know, hedge, a hedge keeps good things in and bad things out. It's a fence. And so it's a strategy to reduce risk when buying or selling the stock. And uh, whenever we have stock plus an option, the stock is always the dominant party in that. So, you know, I joke about we're going to marry an option to a stock, and the stock is the dominant party in the marriage. So hedging is always about what if we're wrong. So if I buy the stock, I'm long the stock, I'm afraid it's going to go down. And so what I would do is either buy a put for protection or sell a, a, a call for income. So always hedge with the opposite market attitude. Uh, best protection, the maximum or uh, you know, full hedge, we call it a full hedge, not testable, is to buy the option contract. So if they say, well, it gives you the best protection, again, I'll, I'll link to that 50 question suitability exam I have for you. And uh, I have a couple examples of this where the customer's suitability requirements are, Dean, I want to be able to participate in the big price increase, but not participate in the big price decline. I said, well, let's uh, go ahead and buy a put and establish a choice to sell the stock you own. Now you can also do a covered call, you know, where you agree to sell stock you own. That's pretty cool. How, why not get paid hundreds of dollars in advance to agree to sell high stock you just bought low? And the suitability there would be for it to generate additional income. Let me get out my annotation tool. Let me get a different color. And so, in a covered call, that's to generate additional income. Now, I do get some price protect, uh, decline protection because, you know, I, I'm going to lower my out-of-pocket cost by selling the call. We call that a not testable, partial edge kind of works. So I get uh, price decline protection for whatever the amount of the premium I brought into. Again, it's not an option lecture. This is a suitability exam. And so the suitability is to generate additional income. The suitable recommendation is covered calls. To have the ability to participate in big price increase, but not price decline, buy a put on a long stock. Uh, if it's a short call, it's the opposite. Short call, we buy a call so we can buy back the borrowed stock at a set price. Now, when you're spreading the difference in the premiums, you have two strike prices, and that's the whole point of a spread. The whole point of a spread is you want to stay played between the strikes. And that's the whole point of that. That's a good thing, by the way, that all the action takes place between those strikes, whatever those strikes are. So, you know, um, what I mean by that is it's just a, the credit spreads particularly are very suitable uh, for people who are worried about, you know, their maximum loss. What I mean by that is if you just sell a put naked and I say, listen, if somebody's going to stick the stock to you, why don't you take some of your money? and buy a lower strike put just in case of this blows up and somebody sticks it to you, you can stick it to the next guy. That's a credit put spread. Or, you know, I say, listen, why sell the naked calls? Why don't you take party money and buy a higher strike call, put in a ceiling, and that way if it blows up, at least you can buy, exercise your higher strike and deliver at the lower strike. You're still a loser, but you're certainly not going to be as big a loser as somebody who's foolish enough to do the naked call. There's a certain, certain part of me that does not like uh, what I'm doing here, which is laundry list kind of things. Um, however, you know, our laundry list lectures have been requested like uh, series seven math. It's just a laundry list of all the math that's found on the series seven. I uh, kind of prefer narrative lectures. And I told you, this is not a narrative lecture on spreads. I have, gee, I don't know, probably four hours of narrative lectures on spreads and straddles, advanced option strategies, multiple option strategies. But do put in the comment box if you find these laundry lists to be helpful or not helpful, because if you think, well, gee, Dean, you know, I'd rather that you're actually telling me going over spreads with me than giving me a laundry list of things, uh, you know, I'll take that to heart in terms of whether I'm gonna do more of this or not. All right, so straddles, uh, we have an expectation of volatility. So the suitability here as a customer who thinks Gee, Dean, I think the stock is going up or down. If I thought it was going up, I know I'd buy a call. And if I thought it was going down, I know I'd buy a put. I'd either buy upward volatility or downward volatility, but I'm not certain about the direction. Uh, I wish there were a way to profit. I say, well, there is. You know, the suitability would be here to recommend a long straddle. Uh, again, this would be a little foolish. Uh, the customer says, Dean, I know that I can sell volatility. 
No, I can short the call and sell upward volatility or sell the put, sell downward volatility. And uh, here, I think it's going to be stuck within the trading range. And I wish there were a way to make money from a stock uh, being neutral on the stock. I said, what do you mean by neutral? He said, well, I think it's going to stay with us as a training range. I go, well, we can. We have a short straddle. Now, be careful about a short straddle. You know, long straddle, again, is like any other option position. You just lose your premium. So very easy to qualify you on a long straddle. Is this money you can afford to lose? In a short straddle, you have that naked call. So a short straddle, very testable, has unlimited risk. And I can't imagine on your Series 7 where we're ever going to say that a strategy or investment uh, strategy that has unlimited risk is going to be suitable. I just can't imagine that. Uh, I'm seeing here that we have come to our 30 minutes uh, of the first part of this lecture. I told you I'm going to either do this as a two-part or uh, you know, three-part lecture. If you'd like to take a break, uh, this would be the time to hit the pause button, uh, take a break, and you can come back to it. Uh, I'm going to continue to uh, march here and uh, see where I can get in the next uh, 30 minutes or so and to make a decision about whether this will be called Series 7 Suitability Part 1 and there'll be a follow-ons of Series 7 Suitability Part 2. And if I find out it's going to be a Part 1, I will, and Part 2, I will then leave it to you in the comment box to say if you're interested in Part 2, <laughs> because if you're not, then I won't spend the time doing it. Uh, most people get where they're going financially without crashing and burning in a mutual fund. You know, the three investment vehicles that are most tested on your Series 7 are municipal bonds, options, and mutual funds. And so make sure you are really uh, solid on mutual funds. Uh, I told you I may put this, if you're, you're Series 7s, you're typically joining us for the second leg of your testing journey. Another thing I'd be interested in, knowing that you already take your SIE, is do you think this is too much to put in the SIE playlist? Uh, I'd be interested in your, your thoughts on that. Because, you know, we don't, you know, like, for example, do they need to know anything about spreads? They certainly don't on the SIE. And, uh, you know, I don't know if any of you would have any expertise on 65 and where it should go on the 65 playlist. Again, there's a couple things, just a couple things like spreads, for example. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you are an SIE test taker uh, or a Series 65 test taker, and you've come to this 30-minute break in this uh, presentation, I would tell you that of what I've discussed thus far, the only thing I can think that isn't testable to you is the uh, multiple option strategy spreads and straddles. So, if I put it in there, just ignore that, and the rest of it's appropriate. And in this next 30-minute installment, if I once again bump into something I think is unsuitable, <laughs> unsuitable, no pun intended, but unsuitable to be put in the SIE or uh, 65 content, I'll let you know. Okay, so what we're trying to do here in mutual funds, our second 30 minutes here, is we're trying to match the investment objective of the fund with that of my investor. And so that's why it's important that the fund have a clearly defined investment objective. Now, I kind of joke, it's like tender for mutual funds. Are we going to swap left or are we going to swap right? Now, one great thing about a mutual fund is contrasted with other investments. So I told you that if I break this into two parts, the second part is going to be more or less, right? So somebody who needs liquidity, we do recommend mutual funds as being suitable. We do not recommend partnerships. That would be the second part of this thing about more or less suitable based on these uh, various investment vehicles. Anyways, these are very liquid. I put in my redemption request within Seven calendar days, I'm going to get, uh, you know, my, my uh, money representing whatever that next calculation of the NAUV is, forward pricing. Open-end mutual funds are continuing to offer new shares to the public, but we have mutual funds that uh, are growth funds. They seek capital appreciation. So again, suitability would be to match my client's investment objective of capital appreciation with that of a growth fund that is seeking capital appreciation. Equity income, seek dividend income from uh, stocks they own in the portfolio. Again, the match would be a customer who's interested in getting potentially some upside from the stock, but is interested as well in that income stream. Those two things together, by the way, the income stream and the potential for price appreciation would be we'd be interested in, let me get out my text thing here. Those two things together are called total return. 
And so you remember, by the way, I'm not saying we're going to get total return, but we have an opportunity to not only realize the income stream from the stocks in the portfolio, as well as potential uh, upside with stock. Uh, sector funds, they're less diversified, that's testable. They're more volatile, and that's testable. They typically uh, have a higher beta than other funds. Beta is a measurement of movement against the market. Uh, but anyways, they're more volatile. That means more aggressive. And again, suitability means some people may or may not uh, be comfortable. A sector fund is diversified, but only within its sector of the economy or its region. Uh, you know, I usually use like the Mexico fund. It's diversified, but in Mexico. Uh, special situations, story. I got a story for you. These are mutual funds that buy uh, corporate stocks and corporations currently involved in some kind of a special situation. You know, I was just uh, this morning uh, seeing where Regis is a you know, hair salon. And I'm only familiar with Regis because, you know, mom's retired. I take a mom and I drive her down to the hair salon in the Walmart that is a Regis. But anyways, they said they have $200 million worth of bonds coming due in the next couple months. And they've hired uh, Jeffries to help them out in refinancing these, uh, these bonds. And they're talking about how they're trying to change their franchise model or to a franchise model. Anyways, long story short, uh, the stock's two dollars. And I, well, maybe if I were interested in a special way situation, I'd do more research and say, okay, well, if this financing is uh, comes through, uh, maybe that stock, as a result of the financing, will go up. You know, and uh, maybe it becomes a special situation. Again, more risk in these these kind of stocks, right? Because either the financing comes through or it doesn't, whatever the case may be. Now, this would be a fund, by the way, that at least has diversification within these special situations. I can't imagine any draw of your uh, series seven. And if I put this in the 65 playlist, 65 as well, uh, where you're not getting asked about suitability of an index fund. You know, if a customer says, Dean, I believe that it's a waste of resources to actively manage money. You know, I believe Dean in what's called the efficient market hypothesis. you know, that everything that could be known is known about a stock. And so I'm willing to accept a market-based return. And what I'm gonna do is try and lower my expense, you know, of how much of the, uh, the I say, you know, mutual funds, the, uh, the way I say it is, there's a problem with having monkeys harvest bananas. And the problem with having monkeys harvest bananas is they eat the product, you know, is represented in the expense ratio, right? Anyways, here, if you want to lower that, uh, how much the monkeys are eating, we would recommend potentially an index fund. So uh, a couple of potential questions about an index fund. As I just mentioned, you should know it is suitable for somebody who believes and doesn't believe in the value of active management, the added value of that. It has lower expenses and it's also more tax efficient. You know, the capital gains tax is a transaction-based tax. The easiest way not to pay it is not to transact. And so, you know, typically index funds aren't transacted. We have foreign stock funds. Again, they provide us with additional diversification. And what we hope is they provide us with different correlation than we have from our domestic uh, investments. So that's the test question. This is a good way to diversify portfolio. No, theory isn't true. Theory is just a way of explaining things. And the more a theory can explain, the better that theory is. And a modern portfolio theory says that to uh, provide additional diversification to a portfolio, we would want to be adding things that have negative correlations, different correlations. The example I use under modern portfolio theory is, you know, if I already have Lowe's in my portfolio, Lowe's is a home improvement store, and then I add Home Depot to my portfolio, I really have it under modern portfolio theory added diversification because you know, for all intents and purposes, Lowe's and Home Depot are pretty much the same stocks. What I mean by that, you know, technically or in portfolio speak is that they have positive correlation. I would think it's almost close to one, meaning, you know, perfect correlation. I, nothing's perfect, but I, that's what I would imagine. So anyways, uh, what I'm hoping when I add foreign stocks, is to get different correlation than my domestic stock funds. That would be the, the point of that, to diversify. Uh, political risk, uh, you know, in certain countries right now, uh, I told you about the Mexico fund, that's a foreign stock fund. It's not diversified in Latin America. 
It's just Mexico. Latin America, we'd have additional diversification. But in Mexico, we have a guy right now, uh, the President Day, uh, his initials are AMLO, Antonio Manuel uh, Lopez Obrador. And he's not a you know, particularly capitalist friendly guy. He's been you know, <laughs> nationalizing some uh, investments made by US corporations in the uh, energy sector of Mexico, for example. So, you know, you have that risk. Uh, balance funds would have uh, both growth and bonds, stocks for growth and bonds for income. And asset allocation funds, again, total return is the idea there. Uh, by the way, by adding the bonds to the portfolio, we're also going to have lower volatility. So a balance fund would have lower volatility than a stock fund. Again, volatility is not good nor bad. It's just, is my comfort, a customer comfortable with that, right? Again, that's what suitability is about. Can they handle what level of volatility are they comfortable with? Asset allocation funds, diversified equities, debt, cash. Uh, money market funds, we said are conservative and safe. Life cycle funds are used for target date investments. These are very uh, popular. Uh, you know, the idea here is they'll change for you automatically the asset allocation uh, based on, again, the fund's life, your life cycles matched to the fund. The idea being as Dean gets older, he wants to have less exposure to stocks and more exposure to bonds, for example, as I get older or get closer to retirement. Uh, closed in funds, you definitely need to be able on every exam, contrast closed in funds with open end funds. I have a separate 15 minute lecture on this. It's also in the mutual fund uh, lecture as well. I have a slide that is one of my all time favorite slides that goes over, but the major thing here is they trade supply and demand. So in terms of suitability, if I choose a closed end fund, the reason Dean would do that suitability wise is to give my closed end fund manager more flexibility because my closed end fund manager does not need to worry about redemption requests. We tell you as you're a shareholder in a closed end fund, if you can't handle the volatility in the you know, Turkish marketplace, the TKF is a Turkish closed end fund, or the Mexico fund, the MXF, a closed end fund, we tell you to sell it to someone else for more than or less than you originally pay. Exchange traded funds, make sure, make sure 65s and sevens. Again, I haven't uh, decided what how many playlists this is going in. Perhaps SIE, this is definitely series seven, you know, suitability. But that being said, make sure you can contrast an ETF with an open end mutual fund. And so ETFs, exchange traded funds are typically passively managed. So that means they are more tax efficient than open end mutual funds because the manager is typically not buying and selling securities in the ETF. So that passive management means it has tax efficiency. It trades like a stock, so you also don't have to worry about forward pricing here. And then it's suitable for me as a trading vehicle. So mutual ones are typically longer term. And ETFs, I would know, are more oriented towards people who want to trade. And that's kind of nice because as they trade on exchange, that means they're liquid, but it also means they are marginal. ETFs are marginal. You can buy them, borrow to purchase them. You can use them as collateral to borrow against. Uh, you can sell them short. So again, additional flex flexibility. Miscellaneous investment company points. We have A shares, B shares, and C shares. And again, in terms of this little uh, lecture on suitability, we've got to make sure that we recommend the share class that's in the client's best interest. So A shares are appropriate for large investments with long time horizons. And again, that's the suitability question. We're not lecturing on mutual funds. We're coming in on 45 minutes here. I got a two hour lecture on mutual fund. You can hit the pause button. We're just trying to tie the investment vehicle, intellectual inventory, the investment vehicle to being suitable or not suitable. All right, so A shares are for large investments, long term high time horizons. B shares are smaller investments with long time horizons because remember, the B share, there's a contingent deferred sales charge. And at some point, you stay in the fund long enough to waive that. And then C shares are appropriate for a shorter time horizon because of that promotion expense, that 12B1 fee. Uh, we have leverage funds that seek to uh, do two or three times whatever the underlying thing they're trying to match is. Again, whether it's an ETF or an ETN or a leveraged fund, they are more trading vehicles. And when I say trading vehicles, people are short-term traders. That means, again, the question is going to be the opposite. It wouldn't be suitable for somebody who's conservative or long-term oriented. 
We have inverse funds. Again, a training vehicle inverse means these funds are designed to have, again, that term again, negative correlation. You know, we're hoping if the market goes down 30%, this thing goes up 30% or vice versa. Again, trading vehicle. Uh, hedge funds. Hedge funds are not regulated. They're organized as private partnerships. They're not liquid because you can't get in or out of a hedge fund without the permission of the general partner. And these are suitable for sophisticated or accredited investors. Uh, they're, they're distributed and sold, as, as I just said, as a private placement or private partnership. And so these are uh, sold with what we call Reg D, a safe harbor. So that means there's going to be a private placement memorandum to get involved in a hedge fund. And, uh, you know, if it were me, I'd probably think about it as accredited versus sophisticated. Uh, retirement plans. So again, we're doing our, you know, this Series 7 investment vehicles, 91 questions and uh, 60 minutes. <laughs> Maybe that's what I'll, I'll call the lecture instead. But in a non-qualified retirement plan, employers can discriminate, and that would include deferred comp. And uh, usually this is highly compensated employees. I usually use, you know, Walt Bittinger at Schwab. You know, uh, Schwab has great uh, 401k for all its employees. And if, if you're a brand new Schwabby, your retirement 401k looks exactly like Walt's in terms of the match, the choices. But, uh, you know, Walt, we say, hey, listen, you're eligible for Schwab's deferred comp plan. And you as uh, somebody who's now taking your seven at Schwab, say, hey, how about me? I'll say, well, no, that's only for our higher end employees. You say, well, that sounds discriminatory. I say, well, it is. Maybe someday you'll uh, be eligible to participate in deferred comp. In a qualified plan, we cannot discriminate. And qualified means qualified under ERISA, qualified with the Department of Labor, you know, uh, qualified with the IRS. And what we mean here primarily, and the word I want you to think about is you're using pre-tax money. And so that means everything coming out is going to be typically taxable. So in an IRA, the contribution may or may not be taxable deductible. There are, uh, you know, some uh, constraints here. Uh, let me get out my annotation tool. As you can see, this document is from uh, classes I've done a long in the past. I dug this up based on people asking me for more questions. And so let me just make sure we make this change here. You know, since this uh, has been, uh, this doc thing has been published. We passed the uh, CARE, uh, CARE Act, and this is now 72. So just make sure you got that. Uh, the gains are deferred until withdrawn. Uh, Senator Roth, if you're a senator, you came up, come up with the idea we name it after. And so Senator Roth came around up with this idea. He's no longer here to protect the Roth IRA. The thing is so sweet. I think the test question should be about legislative risk. You know, anything that has tax advantages like this is, uh, you know, potentially has legislative risk. In a Roth IRA, your contributions are not tax deductible. Uh, this would not be suitable if you aren't within the income limits for contributing. So it's means tested. And then what's really cool is there is no required RMD, no required minimum distributions. So that's what I would know there. So. If somebody says, hey, Dean, I don't want to get a nasty letter when I'm 72 and a half, I have to start withdrawing money, or there's going to be a 50% penalty. I said, well, maybe we should consider a Roth and funding it with after-tax money. Let me check how much you make in income, because you know, I need to make sure you're within the income limits for contributing. And then again, this may become a suitable uh, recommendation. If you've owned it for five years, uh, the distributions are income tax-free. By the way, you're getting your own money uh, out of it. It's not going to be taxed because you already paid taxes on it. So another senator, so besides Senator Roth, there was also Senator Keogh. And Senator Keogh, that's the advantage of being a senator. If you're a senator, we name it after you. And if you're a congressman, it's just House of Representatives Bill number 10. So that's why congressmen sometimes want to become senators. And Keoghs are an appropriate recommendation, perhaps, for somebody who's self-employed. And if they're making contributions from themselves as a self-employed business owner, they got to make it for their employees as well. Uh, tax shelter annuity is very testable. These are for the public sector, not the private sector. And what that means is you definitely need to know this might be a suitable recommendation for an employee of a 403B or a 501C, a nonprofit educational establishment, very testable, or the employee of a charitable organization. It's for the public sector. 
This isn't a tax deferred annuity, it's a tax shelter annuity. P.S. That means very testable for suitability. Are you eligible? I just told you what the eligibility requirements are. And then again, not a lecture on tax over annuities. Everything coming out is going to be taxable. Uh, you know, one of the things we want to be able to do as an investment professional is make sure when we're doing our data gathering to see what does, uh, what does my uh, customer eligible for? Is he eligible for a TSA? Is he eligible to set up a Roth? He's self or excuse me, a key will be selling for it. And as part of that data gathering, it's very important to know your customer employer, what kind of plan is offered to your customer as an employee of a corporation. I say, do you know uh, what kind of retirement plan you have access to, to your employer? I said, well, no, I'm not really sure. I said, well, uh, when you uh, came to work at your employer and when you were talking to HR, did they tell you that when you retire, you're going to get a percentage of your base pay in health care for the rest of your life? He said, well, no. I think I, they told me I got a 401k. In a defined benefit plan, the employer assumes the investment risk. In a defined contribution plan, which is much more popular with employers, we define to our employees what our contribution as their employer will be. They invest it. And whatever it grows to or falls to, that's what, are, what they're going to get. As you see uh, here in the document I'm using, defined benefit plans typically benefit older employees, whereas defined contribution plans typically uh, benefit younger employees. But remember, the big key here is defined benefit plans, employer, employer has a risk, and defined contribution employee. Uh, profit sharing is a form of defined contribution. No profits, no contribution by your employer. A 401k, again, is an employer-sponsored defined contribution plan. The gains in your 401k are tax deferred. If there's a match, that would be silly for us as your investment professional, not the first as part of our investment plan. Say, well, we're not matching out your 401k to at least the match. Let's do that first. We're going to get a double free tax. As we said, these are defined contribution plans. Now, you know, again, maybe we help them decide which of the funds they're offered they want to pick in their 401k. Uh, make sure, uh, test takers, that you can uh, contrast a 529 with a covered uh, Again, on SIE, on Series 7, on 65, uh, it's on every exam that you have to be able to contrast an educational plan in terms of suitability with a 529 in terms of suitability. So again, we're trying to decide what is the better choice for a customer, Coverdale, suitability, or 529, more suitable. In a Coverdale, the Coverdale Educational IRA is for pre and post-secondary education. There are income limits. So again, in terms of suitability, this may not be suitable if you're not within those income limits. The maximum is 2,000 per child per year, and there's an age limitation for contributing. We don't worry about that. With a 529, it's for post-secondary education. Now you can use it for other things besides post-secondary. That's not the, the issue. So let me just get out my, again, my annotation tool so I can make sure in this document we know what, what we're talking about and what's testable. I said, don't worry about that. I wouldn't worry about this is the thing. What we need to worry about is, again, contrasting with the Coverdale. That's the test question. In the Coverdale, there were income limits. In the 529, there are not. So if I have a customer who's uh, you know, in a higher income uh, area, uh, then maybe this is the way to go. There's no age limitations. And the maximum contributions are set by the state. In a prepaid tuition plan, plan suitable for somebody who's worried about the inflationary risk of a college education. Because if you buy it today, then you don't need to worry about what the future cost is. And that would be the test question there in terms of suitability. So, you know, maybe you have a laundry list of inflation oriented kind of things that you test it on. Uh, we have different types of annuities. We have fixed annuities, who cares? We have variable annuities. Now, variable annuity, I think of a variable annuity as a mutual fund with an insurance wrapper. And it is very testable to know that as compared to, now be careful here, test takers, as compared to the fixed annuity. It's a better hedge against inflation than a fixed annuity. Any fixed income investment vehicle is not going to do very well in an inflationary environment. Now, for test purposes, inflationary risk, 
purchasing power risk are basically the same thing. You know, I think about purchasing power risk as I get in my time machine, I hit it for 10 years from today, 2032. I get out, I have the, my time machine, I order the value meal at McDonald's, I hand them $10 and they laugh. They say, where have you been? I said, well, it's a long story, but before I arrived here, when I left where I was my former destination, 2022, the value meal was uh, less than 10 bucks. I could order value meal and get a buck back. And uh, they said, well, now Dean, it's uh, you know 20 bucks. I said, wow. So we basically had to double the inflationary rate over that 10 year period. I'm going to be better served if I have a mutual fund or a variable annuity with an interest wrapper than a fixed annuity. Again, I'm not saying this is better than common stocks. I'm just saying it's better than a fixed annuity. That can be challenging as well on the exam. Uh, we have combination annuities. Who cares? Uh, we definitely need to know that one of the main suitability distinctions between a recommendation for a mutual fund versus the recommendation of a variable annuity is this idea that we can annuitize and turn this into an income stream that uh, we can't outlive. You certainly can't do that with a mutual fund. So, you know, you can, at, uh, you know, decide at 59 and a half, what do you want to do? Do you want a lump sum, random withdrawal, or do you want to annuitize? Now, if you choose to turn it into an income stream, kind of nifty thing to be able to do, it is very testable to be able to tell my client, what are you interested in? He says, you know, I'm interested in the largest monthly check I can get. And I say, test question, life income will provide you with the largest check for the rest of your life. You know, you say, well, Dean, what about uh, if something happens to me? We can do period certain. Or you say, Dean, what about my spouse? We can do joint and last survivor. So uh, make sure that's going to be on your test in ABCD and make sure you can pick A is the choice that gives the customer the largest monthly check. Uh, funding and annuities, we should only be using or looking to an annuity as a recommendation or as being a suitable recommendation. That's what this is about, suitability. We're coming in an uh, hour here. Uh, for somebody who's already uh, you know, topped off everything else they've got. You know, their 401k at work, their, their Roth IRA, whatever, all those other things. At that point, if they still have money that they want to invest after tax and have it grow tax deferred, that's why we refer to variable annuities as non-qualified retirement plans. They're not qualified with the Department of Labor or RISA or IRS, and you're using after tax money. That's what that typically means. There's, you know, some exceptions to that, but that's for our as test takers, that's kind of what we want to think of that as. Anyways, uh, that's important in terms of suitability. So we gotta make sure everything else is uh, the maxed out that's available to them. Uh, not so where someone needs a lump sum of cash in the future, because remember the idea here is it's 59 and a half. You should be comfortable with uh, you know loss potential. Now there's not a lot of questions anymore on direct participation programs. I get asked about you know, direct participation programs and how many questions. And almost all the test prep vendors go way, way overkill on you know, the, the discussion of partnerships. But I would know that direct participation programs, also known as partnerships for test takers, we can think of those as being synonymous. The both process, the profits and losses flow through to the owners. It's the only investment vehicle where profits and losses flow through to the investors. You know, REITs only 90% uh, of net investment income and REITs are mutual funds pass through, not losses. So I would know that. So tax credits for our dollar for dollar whack out of your tax bill. And I would definitely know this would be suitable for somebody who needs a dollar for dollar whack out of their tax bill, somebody who's a high tax bracket. And this is available for two uh, partnerships, historic real estate, historic real estate <coughs> and low income housing. So the flow through is going to be in a basket of your uh, uh, tax return called passive. So this partnership is either going to flow through passive income or throw through passive losses. And passive losses can only be used to offset passive income. Again, this is a suitability question. On the test, they say your customer has a large amount of passive income. A large amount of passive income. What might you recommend? And you'd be looking for suitability a partnership that provides private losses. Or if my customer has a large amount of passive losses, I'd be looking for something that generates passive income. So let me give you an example of this. Uh, the phraseology on the test, the customer has a large amount of passive income, what might you recommend? So I'll just play broker. I call you and say, listen, we have a large amount of passive income. 
why don't we get aggressive here and take a flyer on an oil and gas exploratory program? Uh, yes, that is the most risky kind of an oil and gas partnership we have available. But if we don't find oil and gas, if we lose our money, at least we can use those passive losses to offset your passive income or vice versa. You see, Dean, I have a large amount of passive income, or excuse me, a large amount of uh, passive activity losses. And I said, well, why don't we get this all cash real estate uh, partnership that throws through passive income to you because you use that passive income against those passive losses. Now I have that discussion in a more formal, long way in both my partnership lecture, I think which is 45 minutes as well as in my tax lecture. So again, this hour we shared uh, this morning uh, is uh, not about uh, replacing that. Very testable. Partnerships are never going to be suitable for somebody who needs their investments to be liquid. Partnerships are not liquid. They are not liquid. So again, this is an unsuitability guaranteed test question about on Zoom. Okay, well, that's my timer saying that uh, this is an hour. So uh, let me know. I'm going to put this up in the uh, playlist. And if we continue on with this, this we're going to make it part two. So if you're interested in part two of this lecture, just in the comment box, say, Dean, I'd be interested in a part two of this lecture where we now talk about investment objectives and goals that it relates to suitability. For example, preservation of capital. We have more preservation of capital and again, we'll kind of do the same thing, go through the various investment vehicles that have more uh, preservation of capital, like money markets, government securities, government agencies, and those that have less preservation of capital equities and partnerships. So let me know if you're interested in that and we will certainly uh, take care of that. Like, share, subscribe, and I will see you for the next installment if we decide to do that.